Hello everyone. We are going to be going through the lecture outline called Review of Normal Development through a series of three shorter video recordings, but you can just follow along. They'll go in sequence with your lecture outlines, and I've divided those into three videos. We're going to start with embryonic development, then we'll go to fetal development, and we'll finish up with postnatal development. So that will cover your review of normal development. So we'll start with the pre-embryonic period. So we're going to actually start back at conception. And the reason we're going through this information is because a lot of the conditions that we see in children in physical therapy are due to changes or problems that occurred during the developmental process. And I think it helps you understand the impairments and the problems that you're seeing if you understand where it came from. So you probably had this sometime in uh, middle school or high school biology. But basically, um, at conception, the sperm and the egg combine. That's how the organism gets a full complement of chromosomes. That's occurring out here at the end of the ovary. And then that takes about two weeks, maybe not quite that long, for the, um, for the, feed, for the embryo to move along. Let's see if I can get my, there we go. So to move along the fallopian tube, and then to finally come and implant into the lining of the uterus. So we have this ball of cells. So we have one cell, then of course it divides into two, then each of those cells divides again, so that gives you four. You can do the math. So we have this little rapidly dividing ball of cells that's moving along the fallopian tube and then finally implanting. And again, by two weeks after conception, um, that little ball of cells is implanted into the wall of the uterus and then that's what then at that point it's considered an embryo. So a lot of cell division, a lot of rapid cell division going on during this time. There can certainly be errors in cell division that occur and as I'm sure you're probably aware oftentimes um, miscarriages occur often without people even knowing that they're pregnant because of uh, problems that are occurring during cell division at this time. And then, ultimately, the uh, embryonic period is from about three weeks to eight weeks. And you can see here the embryo. A couple of things I'll point out is you can certainly see uh, the, this is the start of the brain, and we'll, we'll be looking at that a little bit. Um, spinal cord here, coming on down. Uh, you can certainly start to see some limb buds. You see the eye, of course the gut area and you see the lower extremity limbs. You see the uh, start of the umbilical cord here but we still see a big yolk sac here which is telling us that the embryo is really not getting a lot of nutrients yet from the mother because the placenta and the umbilical cord haven't really fully developed yet and so they're still getting a lot of that nutrients from the yolk sac. So again you see an embryo here and a, and a yolk sac and yet one more. We also see the amniotic sac. Right now there's a lot of room in there, so essentially the uh, embryo is, is floating in there. It's very temperature controlled. Obviously it's sound controlled. It's, it's, it's dark, it's warm. So that's the environment in which the embryo is developing. So we really have three basic cell layers that are developing. Initially, as that zygote becomes a blastocyte and these and those cells are rapidly developing in the, even in the pre-embryonic period, we're going to start with two layers of cells, which is an upper and a lower layer. The upper layer of cells are called the ectoderm, and the lower layer of cells, the endoderm. And then finally in the middle here, we're going to get the mesoderm. Um, and the only reason I mention these is because these um, are what are called the stem cells. I know you've all heard of those. Basically, those cells are all alike. Remember, they started from one cell, which divided, which divided. Um, so those were exact replicas of each other. But at some point in the maturation process, those cells, cells start differentiating and ultimately will be doing very different functions. So the upper layer of cells, again, the ectoderm, is going to become skin and hair, and the inner ear and uh, large parts of the nervous system. The endoderm, the lower or inner layers of cells, are going to become a lot of the internal organs. 
And then the mesoderm is going to become a lot of the types of um, structures that we deal with, like the axial skeleton, the skeletal muscles, connective tissue, etc. So, um, again, during that period of differentiation and development, we could have errors occur that result in problems that will ultimately become developmental problems that we see in children. Uh, this is just a table. It just gives you the same thing. So I'm not going to ask you on an exam, you know, list three structures that arise from the mesoderm. I just want you conceptually to understand generally the developmental process. I mentioned the placenta before, and this is going to form during the embryonic period. And the, the placenta is just a series of membranes through which oxygen, um, nutrients, antibodies, pretty much anything that the fetus needs is going to be kind of uh, passing through to get into ultimately the um, umbilical artery and then t to the fetus. And then, of course, the waste products, carbon dioxide and other metabolites, are going to pass back through the umbilical vein and then through the placenta back to the mother. Now, recall, though, that there's not actually ever any mixing of the blood. So these substances certainly filter out and out of the blood and into the fetus, or into the embryo and ultimately into the fetus from the mother, but the blood itself doesn't mix. And we'll talk more about that with teratogens in just a minute. So we have here, again, just kind of more of a, a cutout view, a uh, little bit more relative size. That here's a close-up of the embryo, and there's that uh, yolk sac we talked about. Here's that amniotic sac as well, filled with amniotic fluid. And again, that's keeping constant uh, temperature, constant pressure. There's really very little, because of buoyancy, very little effect of gravity on the embryo. And it just creates that very protected environment for the embryo to develop. Um, so at this time, things are really small. Uh, the uterus is starting to develop and enlarge a little bit, but the um, embryo is taking up a pretty small, pretty small area at this point. So despite the small nature of everything, and l let me go back a couple slides here. I think this is a good one. Um, this really shows you that a lot of the body systems are, are rapidly developing during this time. So again, we're only talking about you know, up to eight weeks, so, or to the end of the eight, eighth week, and then that's going to be the pre-embryonic, and then up to three to eight weeks is the embryonic period. So within two months, essentially, all the major organ systems have developed. So the liver is really developed and functioning by the third week. Um, there's skin, as you can see, by the third week. Uh, the heart is beating definitely by the fifth week, maybe even by the fourth week. And again, you can see the brain and cranial nerves and the spinal cord are developing as well. So by the end of the eighth week, all the major organ systems are on board and are functioning. So that's pretty incredible. It's also a time of great risk for the embryo because since everything is in the process of development, it's very much at risk for problems to occur. And this is where the idea of teratogens comes in. So teratogen literally means um, creating a monster, which is kind of a scary scary way to think of it. But it's, it's anything, any agent, any item that could cause abnormal development to occur. And so I've listed a lot of examples for you. Um, some of those are viruses. So the cytomegalovirus, for one thing, can cause hearing loss. It can cause microcephaly, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute, cognitive delay, visual defects, and problems with dentition. Uh, rubella, which is German measles, another virus, causes eye defects, can cause heart defects, hearing loss, cognitive delay, and just generally can cause developmental delays in growth and development. Toxoplasmosis is a um, 
parasite that can get passed uh, through cat feces to humans, and this can cause prematurity, low birth weight, it can cause enlargement of the liver and spleen and other internal organs, and it can cause a lot of uh, visual and cognitive delays as well. So again, you have to think about all these organ systems are developing, and so these viruses are going to go in and, and they will radically disrupt that development. Uh, varicella, of course, is a herpes virus, and that can actually cause scarring of the skin in the, in the embryo. Um, limb defects, muscle and limb defects, again, a smaller head, even something as serious as blindness, seizures, and cognitive delay. You're probably all aware now, um, in the news, is the Zika virus, and that's just kind of blasted on the scene in the last couple of weeks. And this virus, it hasn't been firmly supported yet, but it, they very, very strongly suspect that it is responsible for causing microcephaly. So this is a picture of microcephaly. Basically, the head and the brain don't develop. Now, you can see the face looks relatively normal size, but the, the cranium portion and the brain do not develop. And so this um, tends to cause very significant developmental delays. I'm sure you're all aware that there are many chemicals that could, would be very dangerous for, uh, preg for exposure, for a pregnant woman to get exposed to. So certainly alcohol, we know that there um, are a number of significant effects of alcohol on the, on the developing embryo and fetus. So growth retardation, cranial nervous system, a very small head. I'll show you some pictures um, when we talk about pediatric pathology of kids who have fetal alcohol syndrome, and you'll see a very characteristic changes to the development of the facial features, like um, a thin upper lip, kind of a, a small head, very small, close set ears, low set ears, things like that. Uh, nicotine, of course, there's, there's not any demonstrated safe level of nicotine while a woman is, is pregnant, so these, this can result in low birth weight and prematurity. Lithium, which is a medication people take for mental illness, can cause heart defects. Even something like a vitamin, which you'd think is healthy, but remember, uh, especially fat-soluble vitamins can reach toxic levels, and so this can cause cognitive delays, um, again, delay, or, um, deformities with facial and head development. People who need to take anti-seizure medication, that's very challenging because that can cause growth and cognitive delays. And probably not a big surprise to you, cocaine is not really good. It can cause a lot of problems as well, including developmental delays, but also um, infant drug withdrawal. So I know I've kind of gone on and on a little bit on this, but there are, are many, many... Um, chemicals, viruses, things that can interfere. But the reason it's so dangerous during the up to the three-week period is because that's a very, very busy time of growth and development for the embryo. And so the organ systems are most susceptible to disruption during the period that they're actually being developed. There are different categories, and I'm not going to, of course, hold you responsible for this, but um, some things we know are very, very dangerous, and those are absolutely contraindicated during pregnancy, and I think um, nicotine would be an example of this. Um, there are some, you know, we can go all the way to the other end where um, they don't show any risk at all, and kind of everything in between. So, um, just to share that with you. So this is a, a kind of an interesting graph. Uh, if you look, it's, it's pretty busy, but on the top it just shows you the age of the embryo which is in weeks and then it does go into the fetal period and it's trying to show you little pictures of different systems and things like that and also um, the pictures right along the top going horizontally starting here and coming over are showing you you know the size so here's that little ball of cells that we talked about the dividing cells and then you know we're starting to see more of an embryonic shape here um, between the third and the eighth week these bars here, these colored bars, um, show you when the organ systems are most at risk. So that's the red. 
So that's pretty consistent. Even if you don't look at any of the, of the words, you can see that a lot of the red is up before the eighth week. And then after the eighth week, there's a lot more yellow, which still means that there's some risk, but that the risk is much less. So if we look here, um, we're talking about central nervous system. That is at risk certainly all the way through the embryonic period and then even you know partway through the, the fetal period as well. Remember we said the heart starts beating by about five weeks, so that would make sense that the heart is at risk you know, up till about five or six weeks. Um, upper limb development, lower limb development, you can see up to about five or six weeks. Um, the eyes a little bit later, teeth and the palate a little bit later, external genitalia, and then ear development. So a lot of facial head development types of things as well as some of the internal organs. So this wraps up our, our talk about embryonic development and after this lecture then you'll be going on to the field development uh, video. Alright, you should have already watched the video on embryonic development. Now we'll have a, just a little quick overview of fetal development. So remember the embryonic phase went up until eight weeks, so our fetal development phase is going to shift, start at nine to twelve weeks, and well, at nine weeks. And the picture here I have for you is um, nine to twelve weeks. Now remember, the way we technically count weeks of development isn't quite the way people in lay terms talk about how many months pregnant someone is, but I think we can make that um, we can make that correlation. So at um, nine weeks, as we mentioned before, the vulnerability to teratogens starts to diminish. Now it's not completely gone, of course, but it does start to diminish. And at nine to twelve weeks, uh, the fetus actually begins moving within the uterus. Now this is pretty exciting. So you're thinking at this very early time, when you think about movement patterns, the fetus is starting to practice those movement patterns. And really this whole period of, of natal, prenatal development is just a big, long practice time. You know, it's seven months of practice so that when the child is born, they are able to really do very, very many movement activities really well. Now, certainly gross motor activities are some of those, but um, another example would be swallowing and digesting amniotic fluid. Obviously, they don't need to do that for nutrition, but they are going to need to swallow and digest food as soon as they're born, so they really don't want to wait until then to practice. So they're going to be swallowing, uh, they're going to be digesting that, they're producing urine, all those types of activities are already starting. Some other features continue to develop, external genitalia, facial features um, are, are developing and are present. When we go to 13 to the 16 week phase, um, I know this is not an exhaustive collection of activities that are occurring at this time, but two of the things that happen, hair starts to appear on the head and the joints begin to form. So remember before we said movement was occurring, so the muscles are moving and, and the body is moving but there's not really joint formation yet or articulation, so that's kind of interesting I think. But the joints are here are beginning to form. Now it's not until the period of 17 to 20 weeks that the fetus is large enough for the mother to actually start perceiving that movement and um, an old term for that is called quickening. So um, we definitely know movement is continuing here and, and this is when the mother would start to feel that and, and for any of you who've been pregnant, I mean it's a pretty exciting feeling to, to experience that and if you haven't been pregnant but you've been around pregnant women um, you know that it's not until even much later that you can externally start feeling uh, that movement by putting your hand on the on the woman's abdomen. So this movement is starting, continuing to occur. Other things uh, like nails are starting to grow and eyebrows become visible. 20 to 24 weeks is a pretty important milestone because respiratory-like movements begin. Now I call them respiratory-like because of course the the fetus is not breathing, it is um, taking in and 
I guess, inhaling and exhaling amniotic fluid because it's getting all its oxygen through the umbilical cord. But again, this is our notion of practice. The child is practicing the respiratory movements that are required. Uh, that allows those muscles to develop, to increase in strength, to improve in coordination and endurance. And so this is very important activity that's occurring even though the child doesn't need it yet, just like they don't need to swallow yet. They do need to develop those muscles through practice and um, you know, form the strength and endurance and coordination that they need in those muscles. Other things that we see is if we could look at the skin, it would look actually very wrinkly. Subcutaneous tissue hasn't really developed yet. The 25 to 28 week time is about the first time when we had to expect the fetus to be able to su survive outside the womb. Now they're still going to need a lot of medical support. One of the biggest issues is uh, surfactant, which is the uh, uh, chemical, I guess, that allows the lungs to stay inflated, you know, the alveoli to stay inflated, isn't really, is just starting to be developed. And so um, we need, they would need a lot of support for survival at this, at this stage. And uh, they still don't have very robust respiratory systems um, or temperature regulation systems. So again, thinking about the environment, they're still within the amniotic sac or within the, um, within the womb. It's surrounded by amniotic fluid, so they're still in a relatively weightless environment. They're still very cushioned. Their temperature is regulated. The it's dark, it's warm, it's pretty much sound buffered. So they're in a very protected environment as they're growing here. And and so to go at this early stage into a very bright, cold, noisy environment, uh, and where gravity has full effect would be a dramatic onslaught to the fetus and so that that would be a really challenging transition this early. The eyes do open and close at this point um, and in boys the scrotum is developed and the testes are starting to descend uh, from the abdo abdominal area where they were developing down into the scrotum. As we move to 29 to 32 weeks uh, we know that some of the special senses are developing, such as taste, for example. The testes have descended, um, and the bones are fully developed. So we have, now remember, it's not all, it's not bony tissue, it's mostly cartilaginous uh, framework, and that will slowly ossify over a number of years, up through, you know, into early adulthood. But we do have all the, all the bones present, all the joints present, so everything we need from a motor standpoint is, is certainly developed there. Um, we don't have a picture of 33 to 36 weeks, but uh, the nails reach the tip of the fingers and they have a firm grasp. And then at full term, which is 38 to 40 weeks, you see everything should be fully formed. The subcutaneous tissue has developed, and remember that's important, not just so the baby looks pretty, but for cushioning and for temperature control as well. The other thing that you see is the fetus um, will tend to turn and assume a head down position. Now, obviously prior to this, the fetus has been moving and turning a lot, but we do see very close to birth assuming a head down position. So that's gonna facilitate um, exit through the, the vaginal canal and it'll facilitate birth. So this takes us through to the end of the fetal, fetal period. And again, I just wanna emphasize the, the practicing that's going on and the environment in which it's occurring. So the child's been in a definitely a weight-reduced environment, a sound-protected environment. It's been dark, it's been warm, and it's been pretty cramped as well. So the child's been in this environment practicing all the movement activities that it needs to do upon birth. All right, so when you go to the next video, we will talk about the postnatal period and talk about um, development up through the rest of the lifespan very, very quickly. Oh, I forgot we have this slide. Here's some things parents like to know. So it's a little encapsulation of just some other different things that occur. Some of these I mentioned, some of these I didn't, but it's always an interesting thing um, to kind of see what's going on. And 
if you've been pregnant or if you are planning to become pregnant, there are a lot of really just little fun books or resources that you can get that every day tell you a little bit of something about what's going on with, with, with fetal development. So it, that can be fascinating. All right, thank you. Welcome to the third video for the review of normal development and now we're going to talk about postnatal development. We've gone through embryonic development and prenatal and so natal of course means to be born. So here is the, f the long awaited moment, birth. So the neonatal period, neo meaning new, newly born period is from birth up till four weeks, so the first month of life. And essentially up until now, as we discussed, the fetus has been experiencing life, which has been pretty good. It's been dim, it hasn't been too loud, it's been warm, it's been cushioned, and they've been able to move, but in a fairly constrained area. So now, all of a sudden, they're thrust into this very cold, very bright, very noisy life, and, and you know what? I would cry too. So we can notice a few things. Um, good, lusty cry. We can't hear it, but we can imagine it. And this is occasioned because the umbilical cord has been cut and oxygen supply from the mother basically stops and it stimulates the respiratory centers so the child starts breathing. And again, this is in, in pretty unpleasant st stimuli or sensory experiences that the child's experiencing. So crying actually helps with deeper inspiration and more forceful expiration. And you know they suction out and get all rid of all the fluids and all that. Now some of the things you can notice, I'm gonna, I'll come back to this, but you can tell how nice and pink the head and the trunk are, but it looks like the feet and the hands are still a little bit, kind of have a dusky blue. So kind of keep that in mind and we'll talk about that. You can also see um, the child has a lot of physiological flexion. The arms and the legs are in a lot of flexion, they're held very close to the body, and this is what we want to see. We don't want to see a very um, floppy baby, we don't want to see arms and legs kind of just displaying out to the side. We want to see um, this, flex this physiological flexion here. Another interesting thing is with the cardiac system. Uh, I know we talked a lot about the fact that during the prenatal period in particular, the child is doing a lot of practicing for real life and swallowing and digesting and breathing but of course the lungs aren't getting any oxygen so there's no reason to send blood through the respiratory um, vascular system of the lungs so there's actually a little hole called the foramen ovale between the right and the left atria and so there's no need, again, for blood to go to the right ventricle, out to the lungs, come back to the, to the left area, and then to the left ventricle. So um, there's a little bit of hole there, so it doesn't go to the right ventricle into the lungs. It just goes pretty much over to the left atria, to the ventricle, and then out to the body. Now, as soon as the baby's born, because of the respiratory issues and changes in pressure, the pressure kind of forces that um, foramen closed, and then very quickly it heals over and so that forces that close. So if you've ever heard of, of a baby being bored with a hole in their heart, it could mean a, a variety of things, but often it means that this foramen ovale doesn't adequately close and it doesn't heal over. So anyway, so this happens really again right as the child um, is breathing with the changes in pressure within the intrathoracic cavity, uh, the blood coming in and then needing to circulate of course now out to the lungs. Uh, the pressures do force that foramen to close. So lots of things are happening to the baby within the first couple of minutes. You know, they're being weighed, they're taking blood, they're checking reflexes and doing all sorts of things and pretty much the baby's like not happy with any of this. But that's good. We want them to be responding to their environment uh, which has been a kind of a rude awakening from a figurative and a literal sense. So um, the, the child is actually scored at the first minute and the five minute mark on a variety of areas. And this is called APGAR scoring. And the things that they are looking at um, are heart rate, respiration, color, which and that's what I was pointing out to you before, muscle tone, and response to stimuli. So again, response to stimuli um, you know, when they have blood drawn, when they are getting suctioned, are they, are they pulling away from that? Are they crying? Are they 
responding appropriately to, to this type of stimuli. The babies are scored on a 0, 1, or 2 scale, and I'll show you that scale in a second. So this baby looks nice and pink all over. Um, the trunk and the hands and the feet, the distal extremities are nice and pink. But let's look back here, you see how there's still a little bit of a dusky color, uh, indicating that we quite, haven't quite gotten the fully oxygenated blood all the way out to those distal extremities. So our scale here with heart rate, um, probably no surprise if there's no heart rate, they wouldn't get any points. Remember the infant heartbeat is very rapid, so if it's less than 100 beats a minute, that's really not very good, that's too slow, so they would want to see it over 100 beats a minute. Respiratory rate, again, we don't want them not breathing, we don't want it irregular or shallow, so we want them vigorous and crying, so that's again two points. Color I talked about, pale or blue all over, the pale or blue extremities, and that's what we saw just a little bit in the distal extremities, or nice and pink. We don't want absent muscle tone. We don't want them to have little. We don't want them hypotonic. We want to see nice active movement. We want to see a lot of kicking of the arms and legs. And again, reflex irritability. Are they reacting to things that are kind of unpleasant um, by avoiding them, by pulling their head away, pulling their limbs away? Are they just grimacing or are those absent? So again, at one minute, we would want to see a score of 8 to 10. And by five minutes, we would want to see uh, a score of 10, so two points on each of these. If they have a score of less than two at one minute or less than six at five minutes, that would indicate very severe medical involvement. A score of less than six persisting at five minutes is correlated with um, potentially long-term cognitive or developmental defects. All right. Well, moving into infancy, this is when we get from the end of the first month through the first year, and I know you spent a lot of time in neuro last semester talking about all these milestones, so I'm going to go through them very briefly with you, just kind of tickle your memory and give you a little overview. So um, remember that the baby is born um, at about seven and a half pounds, so by the end of the first year, they're... they're um, their weight should generally triple and we should also see they're born at about 20 or 21 inches and we should also see that increasing as well and we'll look at that in a minute but that growth and that development correlates very highly to their ability to perform these motor milestones so at four months we should see good head control indicating a nice balance between the head and neck flexors and nice little prone on elbows stance there with that baby um, six to eight months, we should see some pretty active rolling. Remember, this is called creeping, not crawling. Uh, so they should be creeping around about eight months. Pull to stand can be in that similar time frame, eight to nine months, as can cruising. So you can see a lot of overlap with normal infants among these types of motor activities. I'm sure you're well aware that some children never really creep, and they go right to pull to stand. So there is a lot of variety, and I know you covered that. Um, and then finally, with walking, we should see that developing anywhere from even 9 or 10 months up to 18 months of age. And this is a pretty typical um, infant slash tod early toddler gait, gait pattern. You can see a really wide base of support. Uh, you see mostly um, a lot of hip abduction, not just necessarily flexion. Uh, the arms are up in high guard. That facilitates um, stability in the trunk by having the scapula retracted. It engages the trunk extensors, and so that helps the child to keep their balance. All right, so we've made it through infancy, so now that takes us into childhood. And so I'm just going to be kind of going over in general uh, the different age ranges, and this sets the tone for really the entire course. Um, as I mentioned, in this unit, we're just going to go through adolescence, but then, of course, in subsequent units. So we're going to kind of just do a quick overview of development through the lifespan today, and then we'll get in a lot more detail on our subsequent lectures. So childhood, again, end of the first year to puberty. Puberty can range anywhere from 8 to 12 years. It tends to be a little bit earlier in girls and a little bit later in boys. And during this time, from a motor standpoint, really by the year age of 6, we should have very stable basic motor skills and then through the rest of adolescence 
up until adulthood, um, we see a lot of refinement of those motor skills. So here's an example of one thing that happens in childhood. Little kids lose their baby teeth or their deciduous teeth, and uh, they're replaced by permanent teeth. We certainly see rapid development of fine motor skills uh, and intellectual skills. And you can see here, this little girl is writing a note to Santa Claus at the North Pole, of course. This. I don't have a picture right now of adolescence, so this slide's a little bit later. But with adolescence, um, puberty is. 18 to 20 years of age, and we'll go through in great detail on the adolescent lecture some of the physiological and changes, but we know again, as I mentioned, girls are going to begin that growth spurt a little bit earlier, 12 to 13 years of age, and boys begin it a little bit later. We see some changes in um, body fat distribution, for example. Girls tend to increase their percent body fat, where boys tend to decrease it, and of course sexual maturity occurs. We have a lot of psychosocial changes, as those of you, I know all of you have been adolescents, and so you may remember, but luckily memory dims some of our more uh, unpleasant experiences like adolescence, but certainly if you're a parent, you will have very good memories of what adolescence is like, and basically it's the struggle of a child trying to transition from childhood to adulthood. So overall in adolescence, we see a lot of... Um, excelling in motor skills. You know, think about the Olympics. You know, we'll be having those coming up again this year. A lot of the Olympic stars are those who are in their uh, mid to late adolescence. And it, you can, so you really see the difference, you know, from six years of age where they've just developed basic motor skills to, you know, a mere maybe eight or ten years later, they've developed worldwide levels of expertise. So it's a pretty incredible amount of change in motor skills that can occur through that time. And of course it's accompanied by rapid changes in growth in, in all other areas as well. So we'll talk more about that. Uh, with adulthood, the end of adolescence to old age, and um, then senescence is old age until death. And so we'll talk a lot more about that later in the course. So I wanted to go and talk about factors that affect development of movement. And so when we talk about in this case, I, I am referring to development of movement embryologically, fetally, and in, in childhood. And so I just pulled this slide up again from the fetal development lecture. And then remember, this is when we said that we would start to, the, the fetus would start to move. And by 20 weeks of gestation, there are a number of movement patterns. And in the newborn, they have documented over 40 different stereotypical movement patterns. These are spontaneous movement patterns. So we've talked a lot about that concept of practice. So when we think about children who have developmental disabilities, they are not just disadvantaged at birth. They haven't even had the practice, the normal practice that other children have had in the fetal development phase. So they're born already behind the curve because these kids with fetal development or fetal problems or developmental cognitive pro not cognitive, um, sorry, just a little word finding. See, it happens on video slides as well as in person. Um, congenital, that's the word I was trying to think of, with congenital problems are disadvantaged because they have lost that, you know, 38 to 40 weeks of practice that all the other kids have been able to do. So we see that right away. Um, And again, all the normal components of normal movement are established by six months of age. Now this is postnatally. So really incredible how early. And so it, it certainly highlights the importance of early intervention. And we'll be talking in another lecture about different settings in which you may interact with kids. And, and one of those is, a birth, is the neonatal intensive care unit, where you may be treating children who have been born prematurely and of course in the birth to three program. So that importance of early intervention just can't be emphasized. So another thing we see happening um, up until about six years of age is the process of myelination. And, and this has been posited as one of the big reasons why we see the development of those basic motor skills kind of correlates along with the process of myelination. 
Now, I would imagine last semester in neuro, in neuro course with Dr. Ginther, you talked about a systems theory of development. And despite the fact that we know all systems contribute strongly, there's just no argument that the neurological system probably drives motor development and, and movement development str as stronger than any other system. So we definitely have, um, all systems are important, but certainly development in the neurological system drives it a lot. We certainly have musculoskeletal factors, and as I mentioned before, children are usually about 20, 21 inches. They're about a seven, seven and a half pounds at birth. That weight doubles within just a few months. Um, by the year, one year of age, it should have tripled, and um, their growth, they should have added, an, they should be half again as long or tall, so they should have added another 10 inches or so to their, to their height. And so I just give you these things, not because I want you to memorize them, but there is a very high correlation between the attainment of the motor milestones we just talked about and the child's placement on these height and weight charts. So kids that are in the 90, 95th percentile do much better on their motor milestones. So that probably isn't too surprising. If they're um, stronger, they're going to be able to do more activities. Um, we see changes in body proportion, certainly throughout the lifespan. Um, so uh, these are prenatal, two months and five months during the prenatal phase. And then, or fetal phase, and then of course uh, the newborn. But we still definitely see that the newborn head is much bigger in proportion to the rest of the body than the adult head, and so we just see a little bit of a um, difference in how that growth goes. And we'll see that the legs grow really fast after the first year, the trunk's going fast within the first year, so we, we see some changes throughout childhood and adolescence until we get to the proportion of an adult body. Um, it, just think about something as, as simple as um, center of gravity. So since the child has kind of shorter legs, that kind of keeps their center of gravity a little bit lower during that first year or so while they're going to be working on, on gait. And then after they kind of start to walk, then we'll start to see the, the limbs growing a little bit, raising that center of gravity. So. Um, I don't have a picture. Cardiopulmonary factors. I already talked to you about what happens right at birth, but you are already well aware that respiratory rates and, and heart rates decrease with age. So as the size of those structures get bigger, the frequency with which they have to either breathe or, or pump gets, gets shorter. Um, but we definitely need adequate cardiorespiratory function, and certainly if we have children with cardio or respiratory conditions, they are not going to have the same movement capabilities as a child without those problems. And then lastly, certainly not least, are psychosocial factors. And, and these have an incredible impact, as I'm sure you're aware, on movement and movement development. So, you know, a child's um, physical environment, is it stimulating, is it engaging, is it allowing them, is it safe? Does it allow them to go outside and play safely? You know, do they have access to good nutrition? Do they have a good social support system? All of those factors impact very strongly on motor development as well. And um, we'll be talking about those a little bit as we go through, but really our focus for this course will be on how physical therapy in particular is going to foster movement development, particularly in children with um, developmental disabilities. So that's it. We've finally finished our uh, review of normal development. So you'll have other... Um, videos that you can watch uh, in this course before we get a chance to meet together in person. Thank you very much.